Okay, good morning. It's another Sunday, as Carla would say, right? Yeah. And we're still reading White Magic. Uh, we're on chapter five. We're in chapter five, page 174 in it's the book. Page, page 83 on the online version linked on the Transformations 1000 um, website. And it's probably going to be linked on the Warrior Charts website as well. And for the foreseeable future, it's going to be Tom and Donnie show. Tom and Donnie doing the reading. All right. Uh, we, we, this is important. We're going to keep it going. And Carla's got things to do and things to take care of. So uh, we're gonna pick it up from the second paragraph on page 174. Um, That's fourth, I guess par I'll... fourth paragraph on page 83 of the online version for those that are uh, curious. <clears throat> um, so I guess, you know, a quick recap of rule five is we're really starting to discuss the thought forms of the soul right. and how um, these things come into manifestation on the physical plane. I, I guess in, in, in it, it's about manifestation and, but it's about the correct manifestation as a disciple should be manifesting, right? Not like, uh, you know, we're not trying to, you know, get a car, you know, it's not for personal prosperity. Right, right. The, the misconceived manifestation that we see out there oh so much. Yeah, it's not about manifesting riches for yourself. It's more about the manifestation of the soul. Yeah, and, and for humanity. Exactly. Yeah, and one of the, so, and one of the big, uh, one of the problems that we have is we don't, it seems like we don't follow through. The process is very much laid out. Um, it's, it's not as simple as, as people think it is. You really need to read from the beginning of Rule 5 again or, or watch last week's um, episode as to, you know, to where we got now. But there is a, a very specific process. It has a lot to do with breath. It has a lot to do with meditation, it has a lot to do with focus, and it has a lot to do with letting the thought forms go um, and energizing them um, so, so they, from the mental plane, can reach all the way down and through to the physical. Um, so changes are affected down on the physical. It's, let's say uh, there's a lot there. Yeah. Very technical, and there's training required you know, to, it's a process. So this is not something to be taken lightly. Right. This is, <laughs> like, oh, manifest your best life. Right. Like, well, I was just going to say, you got to be careful about the thought forms you do, you, you do create because, right, you want to make sure you're creating the right thought forms. So you're not, it's, it's that concept that Carla mentioned before, you be careful what you wish for, because you might just get it. So you got to be careful about the thought here. forms. Yeah. Huge responsibility. Yeah, you, you, you need to have the, the background and, and know that you're on the path, I think, before you really start, because you can, you can mess up. Yep. And you got to want it, and you got to take it seriously. So with that being said, I, I guess I'll start off, Tom, for the first Sounds two good. pages. Okay. Such are some of the teachings concerning disciples and their recognitions, and it is valuable for aspirants to ponder them. It should be realized that though good character, high ethics, sound morality, and spiritual aspiration are basic and unalterable requirements, yet more is needed if the right to enter the master's ashram is to be granted. To be admitted to the privilege of being an outpost of his consciousness requires an unselfishness 
and a self-surrender for which few are prepared. To be drawn within his aura so that the disciples aura forms an integral part of the group aura presupposes a purity which few can cultivate. To have the ear of the master and to earn the right to contact him at will necessitates a sensitiveness and a fine discrimination which few would care to purchase at the price. Yet a door stands wide open to all, the, to all who care to come and no earnest, sincere soul who meets the requirements ever receives a rebuff. There is no question at this time that those who are in any way advanced in evolution are having that evolution hastened as never before in the history of the world. The crisis is so grave and the need of the world so great that those who can contact the inner side of life, who can even in a small way sense the vibrations of the senior disciples and the elder brothers of the race, and who can bring down the ideals as known on the higher planes, are being very carefully, forcefully, yet strenuously trained. It is necessary that they should be enabled to act accurately and adequately as transmitters and interpreters. I would like to point out certain factors and methods which should be borne in mind in connection with inspirational writing and mediumship and which have a bearing on the writing of such books as the secret doctrine, the scriptures of the world, and those transmitted volumes which potently affect the thought of the race. The interpretation of the process arises from many causes. The status of the writers can be overestimated or not sufficiently appreciated. The terms used by the transmitter being dependent upon his educational status may also be incorrect or give rise to misinterpretation. It is necessary, therefore, that some understanding of the process should be found. Some transmitters work entirely on astral levels and their work is necessarily part of the great illusion. They are unconscious mediums and are unable to check the source from where the teachings come. If they claim to know that source, they are frequently in error. Some receive training from discarnate entities of no higher evolution and frequently of lower than themselves. Some are simply abstracting the content of their own subconsciousness, and hence we have the beautiful platitudes couched in Christian phrase phraseology and tinctured by the mystical writings of the past, which litter the desks of disciples concerning consciously on the physical plane, working consciously on the physical plane. That's interesting, you know, because it's so true. You know, it's obvious. Right. Yeah. <laughs> that's, I think that resonated with both of us, right? It's really Look at the books I got behind. I know, right. I mean, not that, not that they're not all, you know, very legit. But I'm sure, you know, that, you know, we all want to hear the tickling of the ears at certain stages. Right. Of and it's almost like we search for the tickling of the ears and you want to hear beautiful, you know, poetries and things, you know, but, but because we're avoiding the very hard, the, the hard work, I think, right? Right. And the, the, the deeper truths. It's like illusion based at some point. Right. For a while. Right. Some work only on the mental levels, learning through telepathy that which the elder brothers of the race and their own souls have to impart. They tap the sources of knowledge stored in the egoic consciousness. They become aware of the knowledge stored up in the brains of disciples on the same ray as themselves. Some of them being outposts of the master's consciousness become also cognizant of his thought. Some use several of the methods either consciously or unconsciously. When they work consciously, it is then possible for them to correlate the teachings given and under the law of correspondences and through the use of symbols, which they see through 
mental clairvoyance, to ascertain the accuracy of their teaching. Those who work unconsciously, I refer not to the astral physics, not to astral physics, can use only trust and discrimination until they are further evolved. They must accept nothing that contradicts facts imparted through the lodges great messengers, and they must be ready to superimpose upon the modicum of knowledge which they possess a further structure of greater extent. It's deep stuff. Um, Very much so. You want me to pick it up here? Yeah. Okay, so the pagination is a bit different on the online version because it's a lot more condensed. Um, but it looks like what you read through is about a page worth on the online version. So, oh, good. so just for folks reference, we're on page 84 now, the online version. Um, the second paragraph. So each generation now should produce its seers. I like the word spelt seers, for to see is to know. The fault of all of you is that you see not. You perceive an angle, a point of vision, a partial aspect of the great fabric of truth. But all that lies hidden behind it is, uh, is occult to your three-dimensional vision. It is necessary for those who want to act as true transmitters and intermediaries between the knowers of the race and the little ones that they keep their eyes on the horizon and seek thus to extend their vision. That they hold steadily the inner realization that they already have and seek to increase its scope. That they hold on to the truth that all things are headed towards the revelation and that the form matters not. They must seek preeminently to be dependable instruments, unswayed by passing storms. They must endeavor to remain free from depression, no matter what occurs. Very true. Liberated from discouragement with a keen sense of proportion, a right judgment in all things, a regulated life, a disciplined physical body, and a wholehearted devotion to humanity. Where these qualities are present, the masters can begin to use their destined workers. Where they are absent, other instruments must be found. Wow, there's a lot packed in that one paragraph right there. Yeah, the, the, whole, so astral, you gotta, the whole astral plane is packed in that, really. You know. Right. Well, and it, it speaks to, you know, getting your emotions under control, purifying your body, um, because... <laughs> you have to have all that in place if you're expecting to move on and up so you got to get your act together it's a quick way to put it um some people learn at night and regularly bring into their physical brain consciousness the facts they need to know and that hang on a second Sorry about that, had some background noise. Uh, <laughs> okay, so where was I? Some people learn at night and regularly bring in over into their physical brain consciousness the facts they need to know and the teachings they should transmit. Many methods are tried suited to the nature of the aspirant or chela. I'm not sure what that is. Do you know, Donnie, what a chela is? Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's um, student, okay. young, a new student, young gotcha. student type of. Uh... All right. Some have brains that act telepathically as transmitters. I deal with safer and rarer methods which utilize the mental vehicle as the intermediary between the soul and the brain or between the teacher and the disciple. Methods of communication on the astral level, such as the Ouija board, the planchet pad pencil, automatic writing, the direct voice and statements made by the temporarily obsessed medium are not utilized as a rule by Chalas, though the direct voice has had its use at times. The higher mental methods are more advanced and sure, even if rarer. The true transmitters from the higher egoic levels to the physical plane proceed in one or other, in one or other of the following ways. One, they write from personal knowledge and therefore employ their concrete minds at the task of stating this knowledge in terms that will reveal the truth 
to those that have the eyes to see and yet will conceal that which is dangerous from the curious and the blind. This is a hard task to accomplish for the concrete mind express the abstract most inadequately and in the task of embodying the truth in words, much of the true significance is lost. Two, they write because they are inspired because of their physical equipment, their purity of life, their singleness of purpose, their devotion to humanity, and the very karma of service itself, they have developed the capacity to touch the higher sources from which pure truth or symbolic truth flows. They can tap thought currents that have been, that have been set in motion by the great band of contemplators called Nirman, Nirman Nirmanakayas, Nirmanakayas, yeah, Nirmanakayas. Yeah. Are those definite specialized thought currents originated by one of the great staff of teachers. Their brains, being receptive transmitters, enable, enable them to express these contacted thoughts on paper. The accuracy of the transmission being dependent upon the receptivity of the instrument, that is the mind and the brain, the transmitter. In these cases, the form of words and the sentences are largely left to the writer. Therefore, the appropriateness of the terms used and the correctness of the phraseology will depend upon his mental equipment, his educational advantages, the extent of his vocabulary, and his inherent capacity to understand the nature and quality of the imparted thought and ideas. Three, they write because of the development of the inner, he inner hearing. Their work is largely stenographic, yet is also partially dependent upon their standard of development and their education. A certain definite unfoldment of the centers coupled with karmic availability constitutes the basis of choice by the teacher on the subtler planes who seek to impart definite instruction and a specialized line of thought. The responsibility as to accuracy is therefore divided between the one who imparts the teaching and the transmitting agent. The physical plane agent must be carefully chosen and the accuracy of the imparted information as expressed on the physical plane will depend upon his willingness to be used, his positive mental polarization, and his freedom from astralism. To this must be added the fact that the better educated a man may be, the wider his range of knowledge and scope of world interests, the easier it will be for the teacher on the inner side to render through his agency, the knowledge to be imparted. Frequently, the dictated data may be entirely foreign to the receiver. He must have a certain amount, therefore, of education and be himself a profound, a profound seeker of truth before he will be chosen to be the recipient of teachings that are intended for the general public or for esoteric use. Above everything else, he must have learned through meditation to focus himself on the mental plane. Similarity of vibration and of interests hold the clue to the choice of a transmitter. Note that I say similarity of vibration and of interests and not equality of vibration and of interests. This form of work might be divided into three methods. There is first the higher clear audience that speaks directly from mind to mind. This is not exactly telepathy, but a form of direct hearing. The teacher will speak to the disciple as person to person. A conversation is therefore carried on entirely on mental levels with the higher faculties as the focusing point. The use of the head centers is involved and they must both be vivified before this method can be employed. In the astral body, the centers corresponding to the physical have to be awakened before astral psychism is possible. The work that I refer to here involves a corresponding vivification in the mental body counterparts. Secondly, we have telepathic communication. This is the registry in the physical brain consciousness of information imparted. Direct from masters to pupil, from disciple to disciple, from student to student, from master to disciple, to the ego and thence to the personality via the atomic subplanes. You will note therefore that only those in whose bodies atomic subplane matter is found can work this way. Safety and accuracy lie in this equipment. And from ego to ego via the causal body, 
and transmitted direct according to the preceding method or stored up to work through gradually and at need. Thirdly, we have inspiration. This involves another aspect of development. Inspiration is analogous to the mediumship, but is entirely egoic. It utilizes the mind as the medium of transmission to the brain of that which the soul knows. Mediumship usually describes the process when confined entirely to the astral levels. On the egoic plane, this involves inspiration. Ponder on this explanation, for it explains much. Mediumship is dangerous. Why is this so? Because the mental body is not involved, and so the soul is not in control. The medium is an unconscious instrument. He is not himself the controlling factor. He is controlled. Frequently, also the discarnate entities who employ this method of communication, utilizing the brain or voice apparatus of the medium, are not highly evolved and are quite incapable of employing mental plane methods. Whoosh. You got anything to say about that? <laughs> Yeah, don't take, uh, as Ram Das said, you know, don't go taking stock, uh, you know, stock market advice from discarnate beings because they're, you know, they, they, they weren't probably weren't successful at it when they were here. <laughs> what makes you think that they're going to be successful at it now? Right. You know, so there's, there's a little bit, you know, but that's deep, you know, I mean, on a very real level, on a, in a much more, serious note though um that lays out a lot of what's going on and what the what all the different potentials uh combinations of things that we're looking at can be. right yeah well and I there's think a there's, lot there there's, yeah there's some care that has to be taken with that application because i think there might be it might be people that can confuse the mediumship with soul again that that's their soul speaking but it's really not so yeah and, and you know dk says um you know don't don't listen to any of this blindly so you know right. make sure you're questioning and uh, you know that's why we're supposed to become familiar with the vibrations of of, of the you know on the way to recognize where it's coming from, the, the vibration of the soul, the vibration of you know the mat, the master, and then um, there's there's a lot there. Yeah, you want to pick it up from here. Some people combine. Yeah, there was. Uh, Yeah, that was a that's a big that's a big couple pages there. Yeah, it's just so much going on here that we don't see and understand on the on the lower levels. You know. All right, here we go. Some people combine the method of inspiration and of receiving instruction along various lines, and when this is the case, great accuracy of transmission is found. Occasionally, again, as in the case of HPV, you have deep knowledge, ability to be inspired, and mental clairaudience combined. When this is the case, you have a rare and useful instrument for the aiding of humanity. Inspiration originates on the higher levels. It presupposes a very high point in evolution, for it involves the egoic consciousness and necessitates the use of atomic matter, thus opening up a wide range of communicators. It spells safety. It should be remembered that the soul is always good. It may lack knowledge in the three worlds and in this way be deficient, but it harbors no evil. Inspiration is always safe, where medium, whereas mediumship is always to be avoided. Inspiration may involve telepathy, or the person inspiring may do three things. It may use the brain of the appointed channel, throwing thoughts into it. It may occupy his disciple's body, 
the latter standing aside consciously in his subtler bodies, but surrendering his physical body. C, a third method is one of a temporary fusing, if I might so call it, and intermingling when the user and the used alternate or supplement as needed to do the appointed work. I cannot explain more clearly. And again, you know, uh, I can, you can totally see why mediumship is to be avoided in all of this stuff. And uh, if mediumship was all that there is, then maybe it wouldn't be avoided, but it seems like it's a huge distraction. It's not appropriate in lieu of all of this being much more right. appropriate and important. So don't go there. Right. Well, I think the mediumship will keep kind of locked down to the astral plane is what I'm getting out of this too. It doesn't allow you to, well, we're supposed to be focusing on the mental here. So. And if you start going there, you're probably going to keep going there and be like a, right. a drug. Right. Yeah. And that's kind of why I said earlier, you know, that, you know, people can maybe easily confuse that with the real desire of their soul because it's, it's, yeah. keeping them, it's keeping them locked down at the lower levels. And the point is we're supposed to be moving up beyond that. Yeah. All right. Four, they write what they see. This method is not of such a high order. You will note that in the first case, you have wisdom or availability on buddhic or int intuitional levels. In the second case, you have transmission from the causal body, from the higher mental levels. In the third case, you have sufficient development to enable the aspirant to receive dictation. In the fourth case, you have the ability to read in the astral light, but frequently no ability to differentiate between that which is past, that which is, and that which will be. Therefore, you have illusion and inaccuracy. This is a method, however, sometimes used, but unless directly used under stimulation applied by a master, it is liable to be most misleading, as is its corollary astral clairaudience. It is the method of mental clairvoyance and requires a trained interpreting mind, which is rare indeed to find. In all these cases that I have cited, error may creep in owing to physical limitation and the handicap of words. But in the case of those who write from personal knowledge, the errors in expression will be of no real mo moment. While in the second and third cases, the errors will be dependent upon the point and evolution of the transmitting agent. If, however, he couples intelligence, devotion, and service, his capacity to receive and hear he will soon correct the errors himself and his understanding will grow. You know, I think that just like, you gotta be patient and getting comfortable with the process again and really just making yourself a fit vessel and not bringing any personality much in, you know, into it, right? Just being so open to change. Later, two new methods will be employed, which will facilitate the transmission of truth from the inner side to the outer plane. Precipitating writing, precipitated writing will be given to those who can be trusted, but the time is not yet for its general use. It will be necessary to wait until the work of the esoteric schools has reached a more definite phase of development. Conditions as yet are not appropriate, but humanity is urged to be ready and open-minded and prepared for this development. Later will come the power to materialize thought forms. People will come into incarnation who will have the ability temporarily to create and vitalize these thought forms and so enable the general public to see them. The time, however, is not yet. There's too much fear and not enough experience of truth in the world. 
More knowledge must be acquired as to the nature of thought and of matter, and this must be followed experimentally by those with acute trained minds. A high rate of vibration and bodies built of the finest matter. The attainment of this will involve discipline, pain, self-abnegation, and abstinence. See you to it. Dang. That's uh we're not really makes you feel makes you kind of feel inadequate and then a little bit of you know like really gotta like pre it's like uh pressing like it's pressing right on us to really get our stuff together. Yep, stop messing around. Like this is work. It's not all fun and games. Yeah. I mean, it says it right there in the section of the last, well, yeah. The attainment of this will involve discipline, pain, self-affectation, and abstinence. That's, it's all of those, no doubt. <laughs> it's just a long, it's a big jump from early physical pain in life, nor, you know, as we knew, as you knew it. Right. To the waking, and then whoa, all the way over to here. That's a big, uh, it's a big leap, man. Yeah, so that's all I'm saying. You know, see you to it. Okay, well, let's. All right. The group of teachers with whom the average aspirants and probationary disciples may be in touch on the mental love, mental plane are but men of like passions, but with a longer experience upon the path and a wiser control of themselves. They do not work with aspirants because they personally like or care for them, but because the need is great and they seek those whom they can train. The attitude of mind that they look for is that of teachableness and the ability to record and refrain from questioning until more is known. Then the aspirant is urged to question everything. May I remind you of the words of one teacher who said, know us for sane and balanced men who teach as we taught on earth, not flattering our pupils, but disciplining them. We lead them on not forcing them forward by feeding their ambitions by promises of power, but giving them information and leading them to use it in their work, knowing that right use of knowledge leads to experience and achievements of the goal. Man, there, there's, so, uh, there's just so much in that as far as what we can expect, um, how how to be treated, how we you know we're going to be treated, as opposed to how any personality thought we should be. You know, it's like, hey, all right, get comfortable in this too. Right. This is, a, this is kind of a perspective switch. Uh, we're not we're not going to really be coddled per se, like in the way that. Maybe, no, not at all. Maybe we thought, maybe, maybe some people thought that was going to be the case. You know, I don't know. I can totally see that. As a child, I think you, you kind of want to be, but now as we grow up, it's like, right. Okay. How often does one find a student more occupied with the master and what he will do than he is with his own side of the question? How often does one how often how often does one find a student more occupied with the master and what he will do than he is with his own side of the question? And yet the fitting of himself for service and the equipping of himself for useful cooperation is or should be his main preoccupation. You know, this is so great for military guys, man, I think. Military people in general, 
this is what you know on a on a low, lower level we we've had to prepare ourselves in this way um, analogously to to this right right yeah because you truly have to be selfless to endeavor through a lot of that you have to be it's the only way it works making yourself a good soldier and be ready to be told what to do by those above you yeah and you're not going to be coddled along the way as you indicated earlier so it's, it's not an easy road right Oh, yeah. It's not intended to be an easy road. But it's also not going to be uh, an emotional roller coaster like uh, it was on the physical or in the uh, in the military. You know, they're, right. they're not going to be berating any, anybody. You're not going to be getting yelled at and, and punished in a lot of the same personality ways that so you can have you know be of good cheer of that because mm -hmm. the analogy does not directly correlate to like marine corps boot camp or something right you know it's right. much more it is much more logical and more gentle and you know approached from a you know an elevated way yeah all right. Inquiry about the master is more interesting than inquiry about the needed qualifications for discipleship. Interest for the data available in relation to the adepts is more potent than the steadfast investigation into limitations and disabilities which should engross the aspirant's attention. Curiosity as to the habits and methods of specific masters and their ways of handling their disciples is more prone to be displayed than patient application to right habits and ways of work in the life of the would-be disciple. All these matters are side issues and only handicap and limit. And one of the first things we advise one who would enter into communication with the masters is to take his eyes off those things which concern him not, focus his attention on the needed steps and stages which should demonstrate in his life and eliminate those wasted moments, moods, and thought periods, which so often occupy the major part of his thought life. Man, that is beautiful. When a master seeks to find those fitted to be instructed and taught by him, he looks for three things first of all. Unless these are present, no amount of devotion, or aspiration and no purity of life and mode of living suffices. It is essential that all aspirants should grasp these three factors and so save themselves much distress of mind and wasted motion. One, the master looks for the light in the head. Two, he investigates the karma of the aspirant. Three, he notes his service in the world. Unless there is indication that the man is what is termed esoterically a lighted lamp, it is useless for the master to waste his time. The light in the head, when present, is indicative of A, the functioning to a greater or less extent of the pineal gland, which is, as is well known, the seat of the soul and the organ of spiritual perception. It is in this gland that the first Physiological changes take place incident upon the soul upon soul contact, and this contact is brought about through definite work along meditation lines, mind control, and the inflow of spiritual forces. You want to pick it up from there, Tom? Yeah. I um, know what's going on, is Item B, uh, the aligning. So this is. Yeah. Uh, I just want to read back through it again real quick. I'm just going to pick, I'm going to read it over, starting with useless. There is an indication that the man is what is termed esoterically a lighted lamp. It is useless for the master to waste his time. The light in the head when presence is indicative of, as you just said, the functioning to a greater or less extent of the pineal gland, which is and is well known, the seat of the soul 
and the organ of spiritual perception. It is, it is in this gland that the first physiological changes take place incident upon soul contact. And this contact is brought about through definite work along meditation lines, mind control, and the inflow of spiritual force. Dude, I, I want to say before you, you know, I, I think you know, I think anybody, you know, watching this or, or listening or even, or just not, you know when that starts to happen. Oh, yeah. You know when you become a, a lighted lamp in a sense, even though you may not recognize what's happening. What exactly right. is happening yet. It's like, you know, it's that when you have that complete perception change, I think, that you kind of look at things a lot differently than you, and, and that can happen in a flash too. I mean, it kind of did for me. Um, and that mind control aspect is really about getting your emotions under control. You know, how you react to things, I think, is what they're getting at there and curbing those emotions. It's, um, but yeah, you can, you can feel it happening. You might not realize what's happening. You may not even you, believe it. Right. You know. It, it, your and you, your you brain might, consciousness has not caught up to your spiritual you, evolution. You, at that point. you might even think you're going crazy to some level, right. but that's not the case. It's your 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 whole mental outlook is really shifting, and it's like you know, it does take a few cycles. I want to say, like, of you know, through the zodiac, you know, a uh, year, a couple years to see the patterns before it all kind of you know, catches up mm -hmm. and is like grounded in you. Like, okay, this is what's happening now. Like right. you know, where you don't question it anymore. Maybe. You yeah. Know? Yeah. And then, yeah, that, that transition could be happening over a period of time, but you don't really realize it's happening. You don't know what's going on. Um, and yeah, you're, in la -la land. You, you're right, but you're not quite yet. But then at some point, you you just shift, and it kind of all comes together. And you look back, and you're like, "Whoa, okay, <laughs> so that's what was happening all this time." Yeah, interesting. Yeah, you get grounded for a minute. Mm -hmm. Oh man. Yeah. That all starts over again. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm, I'm, you know, and, and really, we're talking from a personal perspective again. But what we're trying to get to is to be of use, so that that's where we're at. So, so, so we digress there for one set for a minute, and then we come back to the be here, I guess. Yeah. yeah. All right. Um... B, the aligning of the man on the physical plane with his ego, soul, or higher self on the mental plane and the subordination of the physical plane life and nature to the, to the impress and control of the soul. This is covered sufficiently in the first two or three chapters of Letters on Occult Meditation, and these should be studied by aspirants. Have you looked at that? Yes, sir. I, I, I did read uh, Letters on Occult Meditation I found it to be a very profound book and worthy of another read and probably something that we should consider on the site. doing uh, after yeah. you know, later on in our work. Yeah. Because, you know, letters on occult meditation is going to go hand in hand with this rule and creating thought forms in meditation mm -hmm. so it kind of is bring it bring more together what we're talking about here right in a more pointed way okay yeah. see the downflow of force via the sutratma magnetic cord or thread from the soul to the brain via the mind body the whole secret of spiritual vision correct perception and right contact lies in the proper appreciation of the above statement. And therefore the yoga sutras of Pan Pantanjali are ever 
the textbook of disciples, initiates, and adepts. For therein are found those rules and methods which bring the mind under control, stabilize the astral body, and so develop and strengthen the thread soul that it can and does become a veritable channel of communication between the man and his ego. The light of illumination streams down into the brain cavity and throws into objectivity three fields of knowledge. This is often forgotten and hence the undue distress and premature interpretations of the partially illuminated disciple or probationer. The light first throws into relief and brings into the foreground of consciousness those thought forms and entities which depict the lower life and which in their aggregate form, the dweller on the threshold. Thus, the first thing of which the aspirant becomes aware is that which he knows to be undesirable and a revelation of his own unworthiness and limitations and the undesirable constitu constituents of his own aura burst on his vision. The darkness which is in him is intensified by the light which glimmers faintly from the center of his being and frequently he despairs of himself and descends into the depths of depression. All mystics bear witness to this and it is a period which must be lived through until the pure light of day drives all shadows and darkness away and little by little the life is brightened and lightened until the sun in the head is shining in all its glory. Yeah. You know, about the dark night of the soul kind of there. Right? Mm -hmm. yep. Which they, you know, they, I think you, I think they say you experience that, at, you know, at different times um, leading up to newer expansions <laughs> and, and such. B, finally, the light in the head is indicative of the finding of the path, and there remains then for the man to study and understand the techniques whereby the light is centralized, intensified, entered, and eventually becomes that magnetic line, like unto a spider's thread, which can be followed back until the source of the lower manifestation is reached and the soul consciousness is entered. The above language is symbolic and yet vitally accurate, but is expressed thus in order to convey information to those who know and protect those who as yet know not. The path of the just is as a shining light, and yet at the same time, a man has to become that path itself. He enters the light and becomes the light and functions then as a lamp set in the dark place, carrying illumination to others and lighting the way before them. The next point that a master has to consider before admitting a man into his group is whether, whether or no such a step is karmically possible or whether there exists in a man's record those conditions which negate his admission in this life. There are three main factors to be considered separately and in their relation to each other. First, are there such karmic obligations in a man's present life as would render it impossible for him to function as a disciple? In this connection, it must be carefully borne in mind that a man can become a disciple and merit the attention of a master only when his life counts for something in the world of men, when he is an influence in his sphere, and when he is molding and acting upon the minds and hearts of other men. Until that is the case, it is waste of a master's time to personally deal with him, for he can be adequately helped in other ways and has, for instance, much knowledge from books and teachers, which is as yet theory and not practice, and much experience to pass through under the guidance of his own ego, the master in his heart. When a man is a disciple, he is one because he can be used for working out the plan of the hierarchy and can be influenced to materialize those endeavors which are planned to enable humanity to make the needed forward steps. This involves in his physical plane life, time and thought, right circumstance and other considerations. And it is quite possible for a man to have reached the stage from the character standpoint where he merits the recognition of a master and yet have obligations and duties to work through which would handicap him for active service in some particular life. This the master has to consider, and this a man's own ego also considers. 
The result quite frequently at this time is that, perhaps unconsciously to the physical brain, a man will shoulder a great amount of experience and undertake the working out of an abnormal amount of responsibility in one particular life in order to free himself for service and chaliaship in a later life. <clears throat> he works then at the equipping of himself for the next life and at the patient performance of duty in his home, his circle of friends, and his business. He realizes that from the egoic standpoint, one life is but a short matter and soon gone, and that by study, intelligent activity, loving service, and patient endurance, he is working out of those conditions which are preventing his prompt acceptance in a master's group. Ooh. A master also studies the condition of an aspirant's physical body and of the subtler bodies to see whether in them are to be found states of consciousness which would hinder usefulness and, an act as ob and act as obstacles. These conditions are likewise karmic and must be adjusted before his admission, among other chelas, chelas becomes possible. A sick physical body, an astral body prone to moods, emotions, and psychic delusions, and a mental body uncontrolled or ill-equipped are all dangerous to the student unless straightened out and perfected. A chela is subjected constantly to the play of force coming to him from three main sources. One, his own ego. Two, his master. And three, the group of co-disciples. And unless he is strong, purified and controlled, these forces will serve but to stimulate undesirable conditions to foster that which should be eliminated and to bring to the surface all the hidden weaknesses. That this has to be done inevitably is so, but much must be done along this line before admission into a group of disciples. Otherwise, much of the master's value of time will, perforce, will perforce be given to the elimination and nullifying of the effects of the chela's violent reactions on other chelas in the same group. It is better to wait and work gradually and intelligently oneself than force one's way unprepared into lines of forces before one can handle either them or their consequences. Another factor that an adept has to consider is whether there are in incarnation, those chelas with whom a man has to work and who are karmically linked to him by ancient ties and old familiarity and similar work. Sometimes it may be deemed wiser for a man to wait a little while before being permitted to step off the physical path until a life comes in which his own co-workers keyed to his vibration and accustomed to work with him are also in physical bodies. For a master's group is entered in service to be rendered and specific work to be done. And not because a man is to receive a cultural training which will make him an adept someday. Chalas train themselves and when ready, for any work, a master uses them. They develop themselves and work out their own self, work out, work out their own salvation. And as a step by step is taken, their particular master lays more and more responsibility upon them. He will train them in service, technique, and in vibratory response to the plan, but they learn to control themselves and to fit themselves for service. Hmm. A lot there. It's a huge perspective switch there. Very much so. Um, uh, takes a, a real different look at what family is here and uh, who your associates are. And uh, it really shows that things are, you know, you have to be very aware as w once you step into these roles to recognize who's, you know, there to help, who's getting ready to help, who, you know, who's there to help us, who we can help, you know. Um, and it's not necessarily just, you know, inside of our family, right? It's the whole, it's, it's just the whole thing. Right. There's no separation again, Erica. Man, that it's amazing. 
Uh Beautiful. We just literally didn't know what was going on before. Right. You just don't, you just don't know. It's very beautiful. It's very beautiful to, to, to start understanding this and seeing these things as you're reading it. It's just amazing. Is it my turn? No, I'll take it. Okay. I'll, I'll just finish out this section. Okay. Um, there are other karmic factors to be considered by a master, but these are the three paramount ones and of the most importance for aspirants to consider now. They are, specified, they are specified so that no true and earnest worker need be depressed and discouraged if he has no conscious link with the master and is unaware of any affiliation with an esoteric group of chelas. It may not be because he is not fit. It may, may simply be because his ego has chosen this life to clear the decks for later action, to eliminate hindrances in one or another or one or other or all of the three lower bodies, or to wait for that time when his admission may count the most. The third factor, that of service, for which the master looks, is one upon which the aspirant has the least to say and may very probably misinterpret. Spiritual ambition, the desire to function as the center of a group, the longing to hear oneself speaking, teaching, lecturing, or writing, are often wrongly interpreted by the aspirant as service. The master looks not at a worker's worldly force or status, not at the numbers of people who are gathered around his personality, but at the motives which prompt his activity and at the effect of his influence upon his fellow men. True service is the spontaneous outflow of a loving heart and an intelligent mind. It is the result of being in the right place and staying there. It is produced by the inevitable inflow of spiritual force and not by strenuous physical plane activity. It is the effect of a man's being what he truly is, a divine son of God. And not by the studied effect of his words or deeds. A true servant gathers around him those whom it is his duty to serve and aid by the force of his life and his spiritualized personality and not by his claims or loud speaking. In self-forgetfulness, he serves. In self-abnegation, he walks the earth. And he gives no thought to the magnitude or the reverse of his accomplishment and has no preconceived ideas as to his own value or usefulness. He lives, serves, works, and influences, asking nothing for the separated self. When a master sees this manifestation in a man's life as the result of the awakening of the inner light and the adjustment of his karmic obligations, then he sounds out a note and waits to see if the man recognizes his own group note. On this recognition, he is admitted into his own group of coworkers and can stand in the presence of his master. Hmm. You want to take it from here? Yeah. That heart, throat, and eye, or at least that's what it says on the online book. Yeah, heart, throat, and eye. Yeah. Later, when the knowledge here conveyed is assimilated, the aspirant will come to an understanding of the true meaning of the heart, the throat, and the eye, which it is, which it is the object of the guides of the race to stimulate into functioning activity at this time. We will therefore consider now one the heart center, the throat center, and the center between the eyes, two, the awakening and coordination, and three, to what uses they will be put in the coming world cycle. This subject is of vital importance to the modern aspirant for the mechanism of the heart, the throat, and the eye constituting part of the inner structure, which he must learn to use, has to be mastered and consciously employed by him before any true creative work is possible. When I use the words creative work, I am speaking esoterically and I'm not referring to the valuable work done by the the artists of the world and their many lines of expression. Their effort to the seer are indicative 
of an inner stirring, of an inner coordination, and a motivated activity which will lead to true esoteric endeavor and to creative work on the subtler planes. I am assuming in the student an elementary knowledge of the vital body and of its four centers, and I am assuming that these seven centers or lotuses have theoretically a place in his imagination. I use the word imagination with purposeful intent, for until there is knowledge and clear vision, imaginative assumption is a potent factor in bringing about the activity of the centers. Let us, for the sake of clarity, list these lotuses with their petal numbers and their location, their colors are immaterial at present from the standpoint of the student, for much that has been given out and ero is erroneous or in the nature of a blind and in any sense, or in, 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 in any case, the esoteric colors are widely different from the exoteric. So, so I guess if you're gonna go be looking on uh, Google, you're probably not gonna get, uh, you know, what the ultimate, you know, truth as far as, you know, what we're talking about here. But anyway, uh, one, we're, uh, the base of the spine, there's four petals. Uh, the second to the sacral center has six petals. The solar plexus center has 10 petals. It's the diaphragm. The heart center has 12 petals. The throat center, 16 petals. The center between the eyebrows, two. And the head center, a thousand. That's the thousand petal blues. Right? Those are the, uh, the different, I think there's, yeah. There's some, I've seen some explanation out there about that. You know, why is alignment with the seven chakras, essentially? Certainly. Yeah. yeah. Seven everything. Also, you know, you can correlate it to the, the seven rays and yep. seven churches, even in the Bible and all this. All, yeah, it's huge, it's a huge study. Uh, Next, let the student remember two important facts, which may be regarded as elementary and preliminary, but which nevertheless have to be worked out into conscious realization and become part of the purpose intent of the aspirant's training. It is easy to generalize. It is difficult to realize. It is simple to grasp the informative intellectual data regarding the centers of force it is most difficult to bring about the rearrangement of the forces flowing through these vortices and to learn to function consciously through the higher centers, subordinating the lower ones. This has to be done also without laying the emphasis upon the form aspect, as is the case in many practices used to vitalize the centers. The two facts of importance are the three centers below the diaphragm, the base of the spine, sacral center, and the solar plexus center, which are at present the most potent in average humanity and the most alive, require to be reorganized, reoriented, and to be brought from a state of positivity into that of negativity. Equally, then, the four centers above the diaphragm, the heart center, throat center, center between the eyebrows and the head center, must be awakened and brought from the state of negativity into that of positivity. This has to be brought about in two ways. First, by the transference of the positive energy of the lower centers into that of the higher. And secondly, by the awakening of the head center, by the demonstration of the activity of the will. The first effect is produced by character building and by the purification of the bodies as used by the soul in the three worlds. The second is the result of meditation and the development of organized purpose imposed by the will upon the daily life. Character building, clean living, controlled emotional reactions, and right thinking are the platitudes of all religious systems and have lost weight from our very familiarity with them. It is not easy to remember that as we live purely and rightly, we are truly and indeed working with forces, subjecting energies to our needs, 
subordinating, subordinating elemental lives to the requirements of spiritual being and bringing into activity a mechanism and a vital structure which has hitherto been only latent and quiescent. Nevertheless, it remains a fact that when the energies latent at the spine, of, at the base of the spine, are carried to the head and are brought via the solar plexus, that clearing house of energy, and the medulla oblongata to the center between the eyebrows, then the personality, the matter aspects, aspect reaches its apotheosis, and the Virgin Mary in the individual sense, which is a finite parallel of an infinite reality, is carried up into heaven, there to sit by the side of her son, the Christ, the soul. That to be heads exploding reading that one, man. I know mine was. <laughs> uh, yeah. So at the beginning of that, he was like, you know, it's one thing to know this and it's another thing to do it. And then, you know, obviously. And then at some point you begin to experience it. Um, or, or be able to look back as, as being able to see it. And then. Knowing kind of what's coming ahead of us, what hasn't happened yet. And what needs to happen. And then these analogies to the Virgin Mary and Christ and the soul, that that's just absolute, that's that's mind blowing there too, right? For the Christian, from a Christian perspective, that should uh, awaken something a little bit. When the energies of the sacral center focused hitherto on the work of physical creation and generation, and therefore the source of physical sex, life, and interest are sublimated, reoriented, and carried up to the throat center, then the aspirant becomes a conscious creative force in the higher world. He enters within the veil and begins to create the pattern of things which will bring about eventually the new heavens and the new earth. There's definite shifts in consciousness being taking place throughout each of these uh, movements. Uh, I want to say you know, or, or I want to say you can sense the the different vibrations of the different centers, and uh, I think it's interesting to to be able to to see it written on paper, something that a lot of people are experiencing, have experienced or will experience, explained right here, you know, it's beautiful. And then to see that that, this, this creates, you know, the new heaven and the new earth. This, this is what's gonna happen. This is all energy, it's all energetic. When the energies of the solar plexus, expressions hitherto of the potent desire nature, feeding the emotional life of the personality are equally transmuted and reoriented. Then they are carried to the heart center and there is brought about as a result of realization, a realization of group consciousness, of group love, a group purpose, which makes the aspirant a server of humanity and the fit associate of the elder brethren of the race. When these three transfers have been consummated, then an activity transpires in the head center, the ultimate governing factor, and by an act of the will of the indwelling ruling soul, certain happenings take place, which we can consider later in our studies. When the second two, when the second fact to bear in mind, is that as these changes and reorientations take place, the disciple begins to awaken psychologically 
to the new states of consciousness, to new states of existence, and to new states of becoming. Oh, I, I think I just, I actually just said that in advance of this. It will be apparent, therefore, how necessary it is to go slowly in these matters so that the mental apprehension and ability to reason logically and sanely may parallel the growth of the intuition and the spiritual perception. Many schools are simply forcing schools, prematurely developing the higher faculties and leading the aspirant, if I might express it in mystical language, directly out of the realm of feeling and of desire into that of the intuition, but leaving the intellectual faculties and the mental apparatus totally undeveloped and latent. When this is the case then, again, speaking mystically, a hiatus or a gap occurs in part of the equipment which the soul must perforce use in the three worlds of its endeavor. The interpreting, organizing, understanding mind is unable to play its part. Where there is lack of understanding and of mental ability, there is danger of misapprehension, of credulity, and of wrong interpretation of the phenomenon of other states of being. A sense of values will be lacking, and the aspirant will overestimate the non-essentials and fail to grasp the value of the spiritual realities. That's pretty cut and dry right there, too. You know, you have it, it doesn't really benefit anybody to jump ahead. Right, right. There's a lot of things going on. Yeah, yeah. And we want them all happening parallel and in line with each other so that you don't get kind of lost, I guess, right? Absolutely. Yeah, you can't really force it, right? Well, and in a lot of these books, it talks about damage that can be done by raising Kundalini too quickly, mm -hmm. um, by, you know, certain types of yoga, um, you know, stimulating the wrong centers at the wrong times. Uh, people want to jump ahead and, you know, get initiated into certain things that, that can be dangerous for their growth if certain other things are not ready to move along with it. That's super interesting. We see a lot of that. Just alignment, I guess, is a good way to look at it. it. Needs to be there. Energy may pour into the four centers in these cases, but because there is no directing intelligence, it will run riot. And we then have those sad cases which strew the path of occult endeavor and have brought the work of the lodge into disrepute. Cases of overemphasized personalities, of superstitious devotees, of credit credulous followers of leaders, of fanatical unbalanced idealists and of those warped minds which arrogate to themselves powers which are not theirs. Men and women become swayed by astralism and wander in the veil of illusion regarding themselves as different from other men, placing themselves upon a pedestal far above average humanity. They fall consciously into the sin of separateness Add to the above category the cases of sex perversion brought about by overstimulation of the sacral center, the cases of neuroticism and oversensitivity and emotionalism brought about by the premature vitalization of the solar plexus center, and lastly, the cases of insanity brought about by the overstimulation of the brain cells through unwise meditation work, and it will become increasingly clear why it is deemed necessary to proceed slowly to develop the mental processes as well as the, the spiritual nature. Bro, there's so much of this going on in the world right now. Right. Yeah, and it's... Yeah. <laughs> there is a lot of evidence of... I mean, not evidence, but you see it out there. 
Yeah, I mean, you could go on. I think we all, just by reading that, can point out probably, now I could be wrong, personal experiences of when you are unbalanced. Mm -hmm. I, I fully know what it's like to be unbalanced. Yeah. And, and have stimulated probably certain centers incorrect, you know, for a time or, mm -hmm. uh, or and had been able to recognize that something was off. Right. I mean, luckily, we recognize that and get back on track quickly before you. Well, that's the, that's the key is to recognize it, and you know, I guess ground it, um, because there can be there can be experiences in there that you associate with higher levels of spiritualism or whatever, and it's really not. And it can be very, very dangerous if you keep wanting to bring yourself back to that moment, like you said earlier, like a drug, right? Um, yeah, it, it could be a sign of something to come, but it's like, you can't force any of this. Something happens, you let it go, you ground it, and then you wait for the next thing to come. And do the work. And like Carla that. says, the wonders never cease. Right. Right. But you can't let yourself get locked into any one wonder, I guess is what I'm trying to say, because that can be a very dangerous. I know that I personally, I personally made the mistake of thinking, oh, this is permanent. Like, oh, right. it, whatever just. But, but what, where you're wrong is, where I was wrong is, change is inevitably going to follow that new thing. So even what you thought, even if I thought something was permanent, you know, like an emptiness or a new level of consciousness or something, right? I was like, oh, this is permanent. Well, no, it's not because you're gonna add, you have to add all this new information in mm -hmm. and then, it has to be synthesized and you have to fit yourself to the next level now. So none of it's permanent. So right. you've got to get over that. I, I, I've absolutely done that too. Every mistake, every, everything in these books, I think I've experienced with the book. Oh, sure. But that's where I don't know. I don't even remember how much I, how far I read or anything. So I kind of lost this place too. Did we, did you finish out that yeah, paragraph? Got, yeah. Um, it will become increasingly clear as why it's deemed necessary to proceed slowly and to develop the mental process as well as the spiritual nature. I think you left the off. Average the average student, student starts. starts. Yeah. Do you want to pick yeah. it up there? Or? Sure. Um, the average student starts with the knowledge that he has centers and with a desire for purity of character. He is assured by those who know that as he strives, meditates, studies, and serves, certain changes will take place within him and that there will arise from the depths of his being an awakening which will be dynamic. He is told that there will follow a breathing forth, a stirring and a vitalizing which will bring his subjective spiritual life into prominence. This subjective life expresses itself as spiritual energy through the medium of the energy or vital body and the energy thus expressed will change his life focus and interests and produce a magnetic and dynamic effect which will attract and lift humanity. The energy is sevenfold in nature and utilizes seven focal points in the etheric body as its agents. There's that magic number seven again. It is not possible for the aspirant to work with and utilize all these seven types of energy intelligently in the early stages of the path of discipleship. The emphasis for training purposes is laid upon only three of them. These are one, that, that of will, strength, or power through the medium of the head center. This is the energy of the spiritual man and comes directly from the monad via the soul. Up to the third initiation, however, all that the disciple needs to grasp is that the will aspect of the soul should control the personality via the mental body to the head center. When this is the case, the thousand-petaled lotus begins to function. 
the line of this stream of force is monad, atma, spiritual will, the inner circle of petals and the egoic lotus, the will petals, the mental body, the head center and the etheric body, the nervous system and brain. Two, that of love wisdom through the medium of the heart center. This center, when awakened, leads to, the leads to that expansion of consciousness, which initiates a man into his group life. He loses the sense of separateness and finally emerges into the full light of realization, a realization of unity with his own indwelling God, with all humanity, with all souls and all forms of nature, and so with the oversoul. This force stream comes likewise from the monad via the soul, and its line is as follows. Monad, booty, spiritual love, the intuition, the second circle of petals in the egoic lotus, the love petals, the astral body, the head center, the bloodstream. In the evolved man, this force stream simply passes through the heart center direct to the solar plexus and expends its two aspects of vital life and of soul quality, one energizing the bloodstream and the other awakening the solar plexus center. This then becomes the dominant factor in the energy life of the man and the force through which his desire nature expresses itself until such time as the aspirant brings about the needed transmutation and reorientation of his emotion, emotional desire nature. Then the heart awakens into activity and the life of the solar plexus center becomes subordinated to that of the heart. This is brought about by the development of group interests, by the cultivation of inclusiveness, and the steady loss of interest in the personality and in things separative and selfish. Three, that of active intelligence or the energy which animates the form aspect and which creates forms in line with the subjective purposes of the presiding intelligence, God or man, human or divine. This also proceeds from the third aspect of the monad and the line of its contact is monad, the manas, spiritual intelligence, the higher mind, the third and outer circle of petals and the egoic lotus, the knowledge petals, the etheric body as a whole, as it pervades the dense physical body, the throat center, the cells of the body. In the little evolved man, as in the case of the second aspect and its unfoldment, the energy simply passes through the throat center and goes directly to the sacral center and thus brings into activity the generative processes and creative faculties utilized in the reproductive work and sex life of the race. This is a broad and general outline of the three main streams of force or divine energy and their direction. The relationship of the head center to the base of the spine where lies the sleeping fire will not be considered here, nor will the function of the solar plexus center as a clearing house for the lower energies be touched upon. I am anxious for the students simply to grasp the general idea and the skeleton of the teaching. Every human being in the course of time works his way back on the path of return to one of the three major rays. All have eventually to express intelligent creative faculty to be animated by divine love and to bring into functioning activity the will as it works out divine purpose and plan. The first center which the aspirant seeks consciously to energize and on which he concentrates during the early stages of his no, novitiate, is that? Novitiate yeah. is yeah. the heart, head, heart center. He has to learn to be group conscious, to be sensitive to group ideals and to be inclusive in his plans and concepts. He has to learn to love collectively and purely and not be actuated by personality attraction and the motive of, re of reward. Until there is this awakening in the heart, he cannot be trusted to wield the creative powers of the throat center for they would be subordinated to self aggrandizement and ambitious of various kind, ambitions of various kinds. Here it should be noted that none of these unfoldments can ever be approached from the standpoint of complete static passivity or from the angle of an entirely new undertaking. We are in process of evolution, 
certain aspects of our force centers are already awakened and functioning in relation to the form aspect, but are not yet, not yet expressing soul qualities. We have behind us a long and fruitful past. We are none of us purely selfish or separative. Human society is now cohesive and inter interdependent. Humanity as a whole has already done much in bringing the heart center into partial activity and in awakening some of the more important aspects of the throat center. The problem with many aspirants today is that of the solar plexus, for it is wide open, actively functioning, and almost fully awakened. The work of transmutation is, however, going on simultaneously, leading, as one might naturally suppose, to a good deal of difficulty and to chaotic conditions. The heart center is also beginning to vibrate, but it is not yet awakened. The throat center is frequently prematurely awakened, though the transfer of energy from the sacral center. Through the transfer of energy from the sacral center. This is due to severe causes sometimes the spiritual purpose and intent, but more frequently to a negation of the normal sex life, owing to economic conditions or to a lack of physical vitality, which predisposes to celibacy. This lack of vital force is in turn due to many factors, but primarily to a long heredity, producing a degeneracy of the physical body or to enforced celibacy in past lives. This enforced celibacy was very often the result of monasticism and the living of the mystical life. When this creative awakening finds expression through any of the arts, literature, painting, music, or in group organization and executive work, there is no harm wrought for the energy finds a normal creative outlet. These points should be remembered by the aspirant. He is facing a most complex problem. He enters blindly into, situate, into a situation which is the result of a long evolutionary process into which he has, not, he has not the key. Especially in the early stages and prior to the first initiation in this case, for he has no knowledge of the history of the past nor any, previous, nor any provision as to the future. He has simply to take his equipment and his opportunity and do the best he can, guided by the old age rules of Raja Yoga and the light of his own soul. As the heart center is awakened and the throat center swings into creative work, a definite relation is set up and there is interplay of energy between the two. This activity in its turn brings about response from the aspect of the thousand petaled lotus, a synthetic lotus, through which the energy always animating the heart and throat centers normally passes. This responsive activity and interaction brings about two results, and these should be most carefully noted. First, the light in the head makes its appearance. A sparking, if I might so express it, is set up between the higher positive overshadowing energy and it's centralized within the form of the thousand petaled lotus and the steadily heightened vibration of the heart and throat centers or lotuses. These two lower centers in their turn are responding to the energies being lifted and raised from the centers below the diaphragm. Secondly, the center between the eyebrows also begins to make its presence felt. And the significant two petal lotus begins to vibrate. It symbolizes the work of at oneing the soul and the body, the subjective and the objective. In some occult books, it is called the lotus with the 96 petals, but this is only a differentiation dealing with the energies focused in the two petals. It will be noted that the sum total of the force petals at the centers, excluding the two head centers, amount in, amount in all to 48 petals. These energies and their two aspects of physical vital energy and soul qualities make up the 96 aspects or vibrations of the two petals of the Ajna or eyebrow center. <clears throat> it must be remembered also that the word petal only symbolizes an expression of force and its apparent effect in matter. The five centers with their 48 petals are synthesized therefore into the two petaled lotus. And then we have 48 plus two equals 50, the number of the perfected personality. For five is the number of man 
and 10 is that of perfection. Symbolically also, if the sum total of the 48 petals of the five centers is added to the 96 petals of the center between the eyebrows, the number 144 appears. This number signifies the completed work of the 12 creative hierarchies, 12 times 12, and thus the bringing together of the subjective soul and the objective body in perfect union at one mint. This is the consummation. To these figures, 144 add that of the number 1000, the number of the petals in the lotus of the head center, and you have the number of the saved in the book of Revelations. The, one, the 144,000 who can stand before God for the three ciphers which are found in, which are found indicate the personality. When man has completed within himself the great work, then the number 144,000 is seen as symbolizing his point of attainment. Then he can stand before God, standing now not only before the angel of the presence, but before the very presence itself. It's a good place to pause. That's a lot. <laughs> I know you've got something to say about that. <laughs> oh. Uh, it, you know, it just goes to show how little we actually know, you know, and it's been said many times that the Bible is, you know, the most occult book, you know, in the world, and there's so much hidden in it, but yet, you know, are these sincere people who go about putting out their interpretations and even create religions based on this stuff. Right. You know, create sex and religions. And we, you know, and they've all heard, you know, everybody says this is it's just, the book is deep. It's there's a lot in there. There's a lot of hidden stuff in the Bible. Uh, yeah, but but yet you're but yet you're You've got a religion based on one aspect of it. You know, right. what we're looking at is the full understanding of what the teachings that Christ brought us 2,000 years right. ago. You know, it's synthesized 2,000 years later to understand the depth of the whole thing and, and all that it involves astrology numerology right psychology uh alchemy all the you know the many different levels of it you know and if you don't know all those how are you going to go about making a, a a single religion on it but anyway the new religion as it said is going to bring this synthesis mm -hmm. But how can we get, this is just, that's just such a huge example of how we get things messed up. 144,000. People literally think it's 144,000. We're just reading it wrong. Right. It's 144,000 and 1,000. 1,000, 140. But like, we just, that's, you know, even if we don't understand what we're saying there, it should be an indicator that we don't know anything and we could just go ahead and stop right now and empty our minds. Right. I'm going to pause this just for one second. Let's do it. So we're going to get into the awakening of the centers. And, you know, I think that this is so, this is so interesting. Not, I think all of this is interesting. And I say that all the time, but the awakening of the centers should really hit people who are, sometimes there's, you can sense it, right? You can feel it physiologically like in your being like you know when some of these changes happen 
Is that, is that in your experience? Oh yeah, for sure. Like the, like your sensations you get around your crown, the top of your head. And your eyebrows. The, the warming the you get in, in the chest. I mean. Right, the, yeah. You feel the energy flow through your whole body sometimes. It's crazy. Like, right. like it's even, I wonder, and I wish, I should probably ask Carla this, um, even when you get that sensation, when you get the chills, like, just always thought it was okay, just a little cold, but is it really, or is there something happening there? Some transference of energy throughout the entire body. So it's like all those little things, you know, that's some kind of little micro awakening, I think, occurring. Something there is happening. But yeah, like the sensations around the crown of the head, I get all the time. And that should really be, you know, uh, an indicator to, to people. On the, a physical indicator mm -hmm. of that these what we're talking about is real and true even though you don't know anything about it yet right so it's just you know how do you get that out <laughs> like hey and it's a strange thing because you but ignore it <laughs> let it flow yeah all right so it's... all right so this is going to be interesting for sure anyway so the awakening sure. of the centers the question now arises, how can this awakening coordination be brought about? What steps must be taken in order to produce this vitalization and the eventual synthetic activity of the three centers? Faced with these questions, the true, the true teacher finds it a difficulty. It is not easy to make clear the esoteric and paralleling activities which are the result of character building. So often, the aspirant is anxious to be told some new thing, and when he is told, the, told some truth, some old truth, so old and so familiar that it fails to call forth a registering of response, he feels that the teacher has failed him and so succumbs to a sense of fertility and depression, futility and, de and depression. However, I laugh because you know, we all want to hear like deep, ardent truths. Right. And uh, that's not what we it's, need. It, right. And you want that, but that's not what you need. And you start to see that uh, what you need is what's always what you're getting. You know, however, this must be met and the questions must be answered. I will state therefore the necessary requirements as succinctly as possible, giving them in their sequential order and according to their importance from the standpoint of the average aspirant. Let us then enumerate them in tabulated form and then we will deal briefly with each point afterwards. One, character building, the first and essential requisite. Two is right motive. Three is service, four is meditation. Five is a technical study of the science of the centers. Six, breathing exercises. Seven, learning the technique of the will. Eight, the development of the power to employ time. And nine, the arousing of the Kundalini fire. This last and ninth point will not be considered as this state, at this stage of our training. The reason is obvious. Most aspirants are at the stage of the third and fourth points and are just beginning to work at the fifth and sixth, which is the, which is literally where we're at right now, a technical study of the science of the centers um, and then breathing exercises. Let us touch briefly upon each of these necessary steps and let me enjoin upon you the need there to realize in some measure the responsibility entailed by knowledge. Do you appreciate the fact that if you were making full use of each piece of information given in the course of the training and making it a, a fact in your experience and were living out in your daily life the teaching so steadily imparted, you would be standing here now before the portal of initiation? 
So do you appreciate the fact that if you are making full use of each piece of information given in the course of the training and making it a fact in your experience and we're living it out in your daily life, the teaching so steadily imparted, you would be here standing before for mission. Do you realize that truth has to be wrought out in the texture of daily living before new truth can be safely imparted. You realize that truth has to be wrought out in the texture of daily living before new truth can be safely imparted. And there's time, right? <laughs> it takes time. Time and study. All right, one, character building. These nine points are to be studied from their force aspect and not from their ethical, eth no, I'm sorry, and not from their ethical or spiritual import. It is the world of force into which the initiate enters, and it is the training he receives as an aspirant that makes such a step possible. Each of us enters life with a certain equipment, the product of past lives of endeavor and of experience. That equipment has in it certain deficiencies or lacks and is seldom of a balanced nature. One man is too mental, another is too psychic, a third is primarily physical, and still another is too mystical. One man is sensitive, irritable, and impressionable. Another is the reverse of all these qualities. One person is centered in his animal nature or is strictly material in his outlook on life, while another is visionary and free from the sins of the flesh. The diversities among men are innumerable, but in each life there is a predominant trend towards which all the energies of his nature's nature turn. Perhaps he is swayed strongly by his physical forces and lives consequently the life of an animal, or he is swayed by astral energy and lives a potently emotional and psychic life. Perhaps like so many, he is swayed by three types of energy, physical, emotional, and occasional flow of soul energy. The point to be remembered is that the bodies in which we as souls are functioning constitute primarily energy bodies. They are composed of energy units, atoms in a state of constant flux and movement and find their place in an environment of a similar nature. Acting as the positive nucleus in these energy bodies and at present in the majority of cases relatively static is the soul. It exerts as yet little pressure upon its sheaths and identifies itself with them thus temporarily negating its own intrinsic life. The day comes, however, when the soul awakens to the need of dominating the situation and of asserting its own authority. That's interesting, all right. Then the man, spasmatically at the beginning, takes stock of the situation. He has to discover first which type of energy predominates and is the motivating force in his daily experience. Having discovered this, he begins to reorganize, to reorient, and to rebuild his bodies. The whole of this teaching can be summed up in two words, vice, verse, vice and virtue. Vice is the energy of the sheets, individual or synthesized in the personality, as it controls the life activities and subordinates the soul to the sheets and to the impulses and tendencies of the lower self. Virtue is the calling in of new energies and of a new vibratory rhythm so that the soul becomes the positive controlling factor and the soul forces supersede those of the bodies. This process is that of character building. Let me illustrate. A man is the victim of an irritable and nervous disposition. We say to him that he needs to be calm and peaceful and to cultivate detachment and so gain control of himself. We teach him that in place of a cross disposition, there should be sweetness and calm. This sounds a platitude and most uninteresting. Yet what is really being stated is that in place of the restless, self-centered, emotional nature, 
and the activity of the solar plexus center carrying the powerful forces of the astral plane, there should be imposed a steady, detached, and harmonizing rhythm of the soul, the higher self. This work of imposing the higher vibration on the lower is character building. This work of imposing the higher vibration on the lower is character building, the first prerequisite upon the path of probation. On reading this, the earnest student can begin to sum up his energy assets. He can tabulate the forces which he feels control his life and thus arrive at a reasonable and truthful understanding of the forces which require to be subordinated and those which require to be strengthened. Then in the light of true knowledge, let him go forward upon the path of his destiny. A lot going on there. For sure. That's the work, you know, recognizing the vibrations and imposing them, you know, and then bringing it out into the physical and, and creating real change. You know, like we can change, we will change. People say you can't change, right? Well, we can. Here's we can change a lot. Well, and you have to. But at least be open to it, I guess. But you have to make that shift if you're going to move. So, and here it indicates too that you know we all come here equipped to do it. Yeah. And we carry all of the, all of everything we've attained previously oh, yeah. with us into where we are now. So we come pre-equipped with all of that and pre-equipped with the ability to attain more. So uh, Ram yeah. Das had said at one point too, he said, uh, and I'm, it's two times. I, I don't know why he's sticking in my, in my, in my head today. He met his one of his friends and his, his, his buddy had said, Oh, Dick, you haven't changed at all. <laughs> and he's like, yeah, right. <laughs> you know, it's just like one of our friends seeing you go, oh, hey, you haven't changed at all. Like, oh, I don't even remember yeah. who I was yesterday. Well, look past the physical. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. I think we all get that for sure. You want me yeah. to, do you want me to pick up here for a little bit? Sure, sure. All right. So two is right motive. Uh, the master of the wisdom, we are told, is the rare efflorescence of a generation of inquirers. The question which the seeker now asks and which he only has the right to answer is, what is the motive governing my aspiration and my endeavor? Why do I seek to build upon a true foundation? Why do I so diligently invoke my soul? The development of right motive is a progressive effort. And constantly one shifts the focus of one's incentive when one discovers himself as the light shines ever more steadily upon one's way and constantly a newer and higher motive emerges. Again, let me illustrate. An aspirant in the early stages is practically always a devotee. To measure up to the standard set by a loved friend and teacher, he struggles and strives to gain and gains ground. Later, this object of his devotion and ardent effort is superseded by devotion to one of the great ones, the elder brothers of the race. He bends all his powers and the forces of his nature to their service. This incentive is, in its turn, surely and steadily superseded by a vital love for humanity and love of one individual, be he ever so perfect, is lost sight of in love for the whole brotherhood of men. Unceasingly, as the soul takes more and more control of its instrument and the soul nature steadily manifests, this too is superseded by love of the ideal, of the plan, and of the purposes underlying the universe itself. The man comes to know himself as naught, but a channel through which spiritual agencies can work and realizes himself as a corporate part of the one life. 
Then he sees even humanity as relative and fractional and becomes immersed in the great will. Hmm. Three, service. A study of right motives leads naturally to right service and often parallels in its objective form, the motivating consciousness. From service to an individual as an expression of love to the family or to the nation, there grows service to a member of the hierarchy, to a master's group, and thence service to humanity. Eventually, there is developed the consciousness of and service of the plan and a consecration to the underlying purpose of the great existence who has brought all into being for the fulfillment of some specific objective. Four, meditation. Upon this matter, we will not enlarge as it has been formed the basis of much of the teaching in my other books, and many of you are working steadily upon the work of meditation. I have placed it forth upon the list for meditation is dangerous and unprofitable to the man who enters upon it without the good or without the basis of a good character and of clean living. Meditation then becomes only a medium for the, for the bringing in of energies which but serve to stimulate the undesirable aspects of his life. Just as the fertilizing of a garden full of weeds will produce a stupendous crop of them and so crush out the weak and tiny flowers. Meditation is dangerous where there is wrong motive, such as desire for personal growth, and for spiritual powers, for it produces under these conditions only a strengthening of the shadows and the veil of illusion and brings to full growth the serpent of pride lurking in the valley of selfish desire. Meditation is dangerous when the desire to serve is lacking. Service is another word for the utilization of soul force for the good of the group. Where this impulse is lacking, energy may pour into the bodies, but lacking use and finding no outlet will tend to overstimulate the centers and produce conditions disastrous to the neophyte. Assimilation and elimination are laws of the soul life as well as the physical life. And when this ample law, or when this simple law is disregarded, serious consequences will follow as inevitably as in the physical body. Absolutely so fine. Needs that to be selfless. Yeah. Life. Yeah. Well, we kind of touched on a little bit of that earlier where we see a lot of us meditate. Yeah. Well, I was going to, because it speaks to meditating the right way, right? Not meditating and praying for the manifestation of your own selfish creature comforts or desires or whatever it is. It's, it's more about serving the greater good of the humanity. And then you're, you can be bringing in those energies and then stimulating, the, like he says, un undesired thoughts you know like like you're and then it builds like uh it builds inertia and then you're kind of stuck mm -hmm. kind of jammed up in this whole thing move it yeah so meditate carefully <clears throat> Five, the study of the centers. This we are now beginning. It is a study as yet in its infancy in the West and little applied in the East. Our approach will be somewhat new for though we will accustom ourselves to the names, locations and relationships of the centers, we shall do no meditation work upon them. Eventually we shall arrive at an appreciation of their vibration, of their tone and colors and of the astrological significances. We shall not work with the centers down the spinal column nor aim at their conscious utilization as does the clairvoyant and clairaudient person. All the work done by students must be done entirely in the head and from the head. There is the seat of the will or spirit aspect working through the soul. There also is the synthetic expression of the personality and in the understanding of the relation 
of the two head centers and their mutual interplay will come gradually the domination of the personality by the soul. This will lead to the consequent and subsequent guided activity of the five other centers. The work in these five centers will eventually be as automatic as the present functioning of the heart and the lungs and the physical body. The presiding intelligence, the self, seated on the throne between the eyebrows and guided by the light in the head will be awake to the interests of the soul and as alert as it as is the I consciousness of this average self-centered man. By the rhythm of, this, of his divine life and by his conscious cooperation with the plan and functioning through the use of the will, must the disciple in incarnation act as the agent of his soul in the three worlds. You could sit on that one for a week. I know. <laughs> no. Yeah, that 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 one would uh, require a, a definite, you know, sitting and contemplating that for a minute. I think there's a lot um, happening. It's pretty compact for what all it's carrying. Now that was five, and that was the one. Yeah. This is the study of the centers, right? And this is what we had discussed earlier is this is where we're at, you know, generally most aspirants are at that point now was five and six, you know, the study of the centers and then breathing exercises, right? So makes sense. You want me to pick it up? Uh, yeah, why don't you finish this out? This is the last one. We're almost All right. five, row five, yeah. All right, breathing exercises. Little by little, as progress is made, will the needed instruction be imparted. Let me point out, however, that no breathing exercises can be safely used where there is no attempt to impose rhythm upon the life of every day. The two activities must go hand in hand. The effect of breathing exercises is varied. There is an oxygen, well, A, there is an oxygenating effect. The bloodstream is purified and pressure is relieved. A symbolism underlies this. For as the blood is oxygenated, so is the life of the man in the three worlds permeated by spiritual energy. There is the imposition, B, there is the imposition of a peculiar rhythm brought about by the particular spacing and timing limit of the breaths. Inhalation, retention, and exhalation. And this will vary according to the, to the counts. C, there is a subtle effect of prana, which is the subjective element underlying the air breathed in and out, which affects most potently the body of prana, the vital or etheric body. Students should remember that subtle effects are more powerful than the physical effects. They produce results in two directions, on the physical body and on the etheric body. The entire vital body assumes a particular rhythm according to the breathing exercises. This kept up for a long period of time will have a shattering or a cohesive effect upon the physical body and devitalize or vitalize the etheric body correspondingly. There, indeed, there is the effect upon the centers, which is most effectual and which follows the trend of the aspirant's thought. If, for instance, a man thinks upon the solar plexus, that center will inevitably be vitalized and his emotional nature be strengthened. Hence the need for students to hold their meditation steady in the head and so awaken the head center. Well, there's the reasoning right there, for sure. Um, that's huge. If you think on that, you're going to be thinking on the uh, solar plexus. You're you're 
your emotional nature is going to be strengthened. Uh, just don't go there. Hold the light in the head. Hold hold to the head center. Steady in the in the light. Hmm. You know, from morning till night. Right. Let no one doubt the effect of breathing exercises upon the vital body. As surely as eating and drinking build or destroy the physical body and aid or hinder its right function, so do breathing exercises produce potent effects if rightly used over a long enough period of time. And what shall I say about the last three requirements? Nothing much for the time is not yet right for their correct understanding. Step by step must the aspirant proceed and his theory must not persistently run ahead of his experience. Perhaps I can give a clue to each of these three through the formulation of a simple rule for daily living. This will be grasped by those for whom it is intended and will not work harm to the unevolved. This rule, when followed, will bring about gently and subjectively the necessary conditions for the manifestation of the requirement. Learn to use the will through the development of steady purpose and the organizing of the daily life so that the purpose may reach fulfillment. Let me read that again. Learn to use the will through the development of steady purpose and the organizing of the daily life so that the purpose may reach fulfillment. Learn to do something else with time besides organize it and use it. Learn to do several things simultaneously and utilize therefore all three bodies synchronous, synchronously. Let me illustrate. When you are practicing your daily breathing exer exercise, keep your count with accuracy. Listen attentively for the sound that soundeth in the silence of the interview. When you are practicing your daily breathing exercise, keep your count with accuracy. Listen, listen attentively for the sound that soundeth in the silence of the interlude. At the same time, think of yourself as the soul, the imposer of the rhythm, and the voice that speaks. This is something which can be acquired by practice by each of you. Discover the serpent of illusion by the help of the serpent of wisdom, and when will the sleeping serpent mount upwards to the place of meeting? And then will the sleeping serpent mount upwards to the place of meeting? And that's the end of rule five. Learning to do several things simultaneously. You know, that's a, that's work. Right? Yeah. I mean, I know we sit here and we're, you know, we think about one thing while we're reading or we're looking towards something, but but this is deeper than that, I think. And that's the perfect opportunity to do it is while you're meditating or mm -hmm. and doing breathing exercises, right? It's a perfect time to experiment with that. I think we need to be careful there though too right keep your count with accuracy yeah i guess you can probably pull that off it i mean, I mean obviously we can pull it off otherwise you wouldn't say that but i mean it seems like it could be At the same time, think of yourself as the soul, the imposer of rhythm, and the voice that speaks. Hmm. 
Well, that was a lot of information. Yeah. <sighs> um, I think the plan is to, well, I don't know what the plan is to where we're going to post this yet. Um, I think we're, we are going to start doing more um, discussions with the group, with the group, right? About this stuff on a, coming from a more personal level. Mm -hmm. This material, this needs to be done this way. You know, this has to be. Right. Well, and to leverage it in to help, I mean, well, the continuation of our own self development, but working with the others to develop them too. And then hear the different perspectives. That's always good. All right, man. What do you want to do? You want to we'll, uh, we'll shut so, this down next week? Rule six. It's a it's a relatively short one. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think we call it a wrap for the week. And then. link up with some other people and have some discussion like we were talking about. So keep, keep steady in the light. <laughs> right? Absolutely. I'll take it. I mean, I, I, you know, for me, for this week right now, I haven't just read that. I'm really going to try to stay focused much more in, in the head. Mm -hmm. Um, and not worry about what's going on elsewhere. Right. So much. Right. Or at all. Okay. Likewise. All right. All right. See you next week. Absolutely.